Hey everyone, it's good to see you again. We're going to look at some of the things that we're dealing with salvation. If you remember on our our Sunday school lesson, we were we saw a lot of things, you know, through the Old Testament ways that God had delivered His people some wonderful divine uh, circumstances that God had had just brought together and helped His people. He encouraged them and He delivered them from many things from deaths from armies from slavery he brought them out and he was doing a wonderful work with them and we, we were looking at the way god saves us the salvation that he has for us we see that you know he saves us practically and he saves us spiritually and today we're going to see some more of the things that the ways that jesus the son of god the things that he did while he walked this earth, while he lived this earth. And we're going to look at some of those things and see the way God or the way Jesus delivered some of the people that he came in contact with. A lot of the people he came in contact with, he he delivered them from things that was going on in their lives. And so, you know, we're just exploring, we're discussing what is salvation? What is our salvation? Have I got it? You know, is it always going to be there? Am I going to lose it? You know. Because sometimes nowadays, salvation is whatever we want it to be. It's what we think it can be. It's what we think it is. You know, we make God up in our own minds who we think God ought to be and the way that he should work and how he should just look at the good things that I do and, you know, just be overall happy with me. You know, we want to change our lives to, to be better that we think. But when we think things are better, that doesn't necessarily make us right with God. So we're going to look at some of the things, some of the ways, and, you know, how do we know we're saved? Doubts come in. How do we know, you know, that we've trusted Christ? How do we know that we've believed in him? How do we know that we're right with God? And do I know the one true God? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good place to start. Do you know the one true God? If you say, well, I think, yeah, no, you don't, probably don't. But that's where we're going because sometimes we don't know how to express what's going on on the inside. We don't know how to express, you know, things that we have that we know for sure. So we just want to look through these things and, uh, you know, our definition for salvation. We want to see this come out you know, in our everyday life and in our spiritual lives. Our definition is this, salvation is a divine deliverance from oppression, harm, danger, or death of a person or a nation or a people group. And it has two realms. It has a, a physical realm and it has a spiritual realm. So, you know, this is our definition for salvation. There's God's deliverance. God is God's way of helping his people get to where he wants them to be it's god's way of watching out for his people taking care of his people and you know that ensures his people that god is always there for them and always watching out for them. and he has done certain things in lives that we will know for sure what we believe why we believe it and why god is doing the things that he's doing in our lives and it's a great life that we're living this is a great time to be alive we think things are bad but people struggle with these things all through life there's nothing new under the sun bad things and bad times come isolation comes but listen god is still god and we can take this time of, of slowing down this time of you know being at home to really understand well get deeper into my relationship with this person jesus christ or maybe it's drawing some thoughts in your mind. Well, is God real? Is he letting all these things happen? So, you know, where do we turn to to answer these questions? Where do we turn to? Well, why is all these things going on? If God is, is love and he's with us, then, you know, why is he letting these things go on? Well, I'm glad these things are on your mind. So let's look at some of the things that have, have happened, that have gone on. You know, these things are written that uh, there's things that have taken place, things that are written down in the word of God that we may know him and that we may understand who he is and that we may know that he has salvation for people and that we may know if we have that salvation. He wants us to know 
God wants us to know that we're saved. So maybe you've been struggling over, over the past few weeks, you know, as we talked about learning about salvation. Have I, am I saved? Am I, going, am I ready for, for eternity in heaven? So, you know, as we're looking and thinking about, about these things, about salvation, you know, one of the things that, that will come to our mind about salvation is this. Have I surrendered to Christ and, and am I committed to Christ? Those are two elements that, that, are in, that are part of salvation there. There's got to be a surrender of ourselves, surrender up to Christ, and a commitment to Christ. To follow him so how do we know these things how do we know that we've done that how do we know that we are we are ready and can we know you know some folks think well you don't know until after you die and then where you are that's where you're going to be whether you wind up in heaven or you wind up in hell you, there's no way to know but there is a way to know where we're going to spend eternity and that's what god wants, wants to give us the assurance so let's just listen to a few of these verses that we have is kind of going to set the framework on, onto this, onto our first uh, step in knowing, you know, for sure that we have salvation. The first thing that we can rely on and be sure of. Listen to Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness, speaking of God's righteousness, is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Psalm 119, 151 reads like this. You are near, O Lord, and all of your commandments are truth. Psalm 16 or Psalm 119, 160 says this, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. The truth is God's word. God's word is truth, and his word will last forever, and his truth will last forever everything that god speaks all that he does it will last forever so now let's uh you know that's what the psalmist says i was back in the old testament but let's let's bring this into view with jesus uh john the gospel of john chapter one verse one reads like this in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and later on in that chapter, we see that the, the word, or in this verse, we see that the word is referred to as, as uh, that it is with God and that the word was God. And we see that when you read on down in there, that the referred is given, given a personal pronoun, he. He was with God. And in verse 14 of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it says, and the word became flesh and dwell among us it says that and that is in a reference to jesus christ and we don't know these things how, how do these things take place how can we be rest assured of this in, in the gospel of john chapter 14 verse 6 this is jesus speaking and people wondering who he is you know what he's doing and why should they listen to him and obey his word and and he says this about himself he says i jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no one comes unto the father but through me see this is what we're asking about this is what salvation is the father is god delivering us from things is god delivering us from our our spirit our spiritual you know destruction that that we have and god bringing us in into his kingdom and being about his business his business and we know that jesus is the way the only way the only truth the only life so as we were reading in psalm you know god's word is life god's word is truth and god's truth is his ordinance his statutes his laws and then we hear about how jesus was in the beginning with god and how jesus became flesh now jesus says i am the way the truth jesus is the truth Everything that he spoke was from God. It's God's word and he is God. He is the son of God and he is the only truth there is. He's the only standard that we look to. He's the only thing that everything else is measured by in this world. It's the righteousness and the truth of Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And because he says, I am the truth. So that puts him up with the word of God, which is the truth and lasts forever. So Jesus is the truth and he is is lasting forever because he is god 
He died on a cross for the forgiveness of sin. Took all the sin on him. All the sin uh, of, of us in the world. And he died and he was buried. And then he was raised from the grave three days later. That's truth. That is truth because truth extends forever. You can't change it because it's truth. You can deny it. You don't have to accept it. That doesn't make you right. It makes you wrong. It make, makes you rejecting the truth. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, you know, so this is what we're looking at. That's who Jesus said about himself. So do we just believe one man? Do we just believe one verse? You know, how do we know what to believe and what not to believe? Well, let's look at some of the ways that some of the people Jesus delivered from a destructive life, from a destructive hold that was on their life. So if, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 for a few minutes, and then we're going to look at the Gospel of John chapter 10, verses 31 through 39. We're going to look at these things and see some, see what Jesus done. We're, what, what we're seeing is we're looking at the way God operated in the Old Testament with the verses we talked about last week, and we're going to see the way Jesus responds to some things that's going on in his life as he walked the world in, in what we call the New Testament. So we're going to see who Jesus is and, and we're going to know who God is. So we're going to see a, a parallel between these two. And this is what Jesus was doing in Matthew chapter 9. He was getting into a boat and he, Jesus crossed the sea and he came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralyzed, a paralytic lying on a bed. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemed. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil thoughts? Evil, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. Jesus said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. This paralytic man couldn't move, he couldn't walk. As, as you saw, he said they brought him in. So some people toted this man to Jesus. They carried him along. He couldn't get there by himself, so they carried him along. They carried him to Jesus, so he couldn't walk. He was in a bad situation all of his life. Wasn't able to walk, wasn't able to go. But Jesus looks at him, and, you know, he says this to him. He, he doesn't really recognize, or he doesn't acknowledge, you know, that he couldn't walk or that he had to be toted in. But he says this, take courage, son. Your sin is forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. So Jesus, as he, you know, he, he goes on in there and you know, the scribes were thinking in their hearts. They weren't saying it out loud. This is just what they were thinking. And Jesus knows their thoughts. In verse 4, it says, and Jesus knew their thoughts. If he knew the scribes and Pharisees or the scribes' thoughts, what they were thinking about Jesus, you know what else he knew? He knew the thoughts that was on that paralytic man's heart, what he was worried about. That paralytic man, maybe regardless of, of what he was, was thinking or thought about that time, Jesus knew the point that he needed to make to that paralytic was that his sin was forgiven. And as all that was taking place, Jesus also was teaching the scribes and Pharisees who he was. For he says this, he says, which is easier to say your sin's forgiven or to say get up and walk? From the paralyzed man's perspective, what would be easier? I mean, he couldn't walk. He had never been able to walk. And for somebody to say your sin's forgiven, well, that's all good. That's fine. Thank you for saying that, Jesus. But now to make sure you can forgive sin, Jesus tells him to pick up his bed and walk, and the man did. So as he picked up his, as the feeling came into his legs, his muscles began to work. He began to roll that mat up, and, you know, he began to, to take it and go home. He knew his sin was forgiven because he said, no one has been able to heal me. I've been like this my whole life. This one man, Jesus, came and told me my sins are forgiven. Take up my bed and walk. He says, then what's going on in that paralytic's mind is this. 
I know I'm changed. I know I'm different. Not just physically, but spiritually. He said, my sin is forgiven. And then he calls me to walk. So this is some of the things Jesus is doing. And in the lives, when we see him in, in, in life through the gospel, through the things that he is doing, you know, these people that are, that are in a, a bad place, they are held down. This guy was held down by lameness. He, you know, he couldn't walk. He couldn't move. And Jesus just speaks a word to him. And he gets up and moves. And there's a lot more in that passage. But this is what I want us to see. The power and the authority that Jesus has. The, the power and the authority, authority that he spoke with. Not just to heal, but to forgive sin. Which is the ultimate here. And that's the spiritual side that we want to look into that's the spiritual side that we want to be part of we want our sin forgiven that man was lame how could he have done anything wrong jesus says your sin is forgiven you because oftentimes we think about sin something we do don't we not what we do sin is this not knowing god and the sin that we do that reveals that inward knowledge of not knowing god as a a a uh empty knowledge because we don't know christ we don't know god and we need our sin forgiven so there was another another example that that uh jesus you know was doing he was doing all kind of works and the pharisees and scribes they they didn't like him for that matter of fact they wanted to stone him they were seeing jesus do all these wonderful things and the only thing they could conclude was we got to kill him we got to get him out of here and in john chapter 10 if you have your bibles you can turn over to John chapter 10 and uh, we'll see, you know, some of the things that Jesus, you know, tells us there. Jesus has just been teaching about how he's the good shepherd, about how he will lay down his life for, for his sheep. And uh, people ask him, some of the scribes and Pharisees ask him, they thought they knew God. They thought they were God's people. You know, they thought they were children of God. And they said, they were asking Jesus, you know, are we your sheep or are we not your sheep? Who is your sheep? Jesus says, tells them, tells them this, that my sheep, they hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. Not one will snatch them out of my hand. He says this, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Then it says this, I and my father are one. Look at verse 31 here in, uh, in John chapter 10, verse 31. This is, they heard him say, me and my father are one. And so that, that's kind of a struggle right there. They were having, nobody's equal to God. This man can't be God. He's, he's living. We know his, his mom. We know his dad. Joseph is dad. Mary's his mom. We know his brothers and his sisters you know they're all here so he cannot be god he, he should not be making himself out to be god and in verse 31 it says that they picked up stones to stone him and it, then jesus just responds like this i showed you many good works from the father of which of them are you stoning me Jesus said, I've done, you've seen me do many miracle things, just like many wonderful things, just like the paralytic that Jesus healed. He had done things like that. He had raised the dead. He had done many things all over, all over this area like that. His, the fame of him had spread out through all the country, all the miracles and wonders that he had done. He had fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fish, and not just once, twice. I mean, Jesus has done great and wonderful things and all of them see it and they hear about this but it's because you make yourself out to be god now remember back with the with the lame man with the paralytic jesus says how much harder is it to forgive someone of sin or tell them the one that's been lame can't walk for his whole life to get up and walk which is easier to do that both of them's equally hard both of it for mere man is impossible no man can do that only god can do that and jesus as he's walking around he says your sin are forgiven and just to show you i have the power and the authority to forgive sin take up your bed and walk See, this is that struggle the pharisees and scribes were having they they, they couldn't 
see Jesus, a man and God. But Jesus tells them, tells them this. Look at verse 37. He, he, he tells them this. If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Jesus says, don't just listen to it. Just don't hit, look at what I'm doing. Are they mere man's works? No, they weren't. Those were works of God. So Jesus brought, brings their attention to that. He draws them in and he lets them know, you know who he is. And you know Jesus was telling them these things so that they had realized, think back, who God is in the Old Testament, know the things God has done. Now let's look at Jesus. All these things Jesus is doing, he's the same way. So here's where we are with our spiritual life, with our spiritual salvation, knowing it. Listen to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 30. And this uh short time you know that we're having right here together john chapter 20 verse 30 says talks about this john is is winding up his the gospel the life of jesus and he says this many other signs jesus performed in the presence of the disciples which were not written in this book but these have been written so that you may believe that jesus is the Christ. This is why they were written down the, the way Jesus was talking with and handling the the uh, scribes and Pharisees. He wanted them to know who he was. All the miracles that he did was to so that they would know that he is God and that knowing that he is God that they would believe in him that he's the son of God and believing that they may have life in his name. He was wanting them to have life. Life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the life that he had, he wanted to give to those who believed in him. That life that he had has is eternal life. First John, it's one of the epistles later on in the New Testament. First John chapter 5, verse 13 reads like this. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. That word know, knowing without a doubt. It's a know of knowledge. It's knowledge, not feeling, not emotion, not getting carried, carried away with other things, but that you know for sure in who you have believed. Jesus demonstrated that he was God as he was walking this earth. With everything that he did, with all the all the teachings that he had, with the question and answer times between the scribes and the Pharisees, with him and with the disciples, he was letting people know for sure that he is the Son of God. And when we know him, we know everlasting life. So we see through the Bible, through the the last two couple sessions that we've had together last couple of meetings that we've had it's been great and we know this that the bible has showed us who god is god revealed himself in the old testament with the things he was doing with his prophets and the word that he gave and in the new testament through jesus christ and later on we're going to see you know through the holy spirit we know who jesus is and he has all these things done he has the bible put together that we may know without a doubt that we're saved. So maybe, you know, you've had some questions and doubts, you know, going on. Maybe with, as I mentioned, you know, before, with the way uh, Pastor Greg's been teaching and, and he's been preaching, that maybe you're different, maybe you're changed. You don't know what went on. You don't know what's happened. So walking through this is going to help us understand what's going, in your, going on in our lives and our heart. So the first thing, you know, as, as we're getting ready to close this out, for this time, I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, know this that Jesus told that paralytic man your sin is forgiven so here's, our, here's my question to you as we end is your sin forgiven is your sin forgiven you saw how Jesus told the paralytic to get up rise up and walk Jesus has the power to forgive sin is your sin forgiven if it is forgiven have you let somebody know we call that as being saved if you've been forgiven of your sin, 
you've trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. You've committed your life to him and repented. That's what salvation is. That's what coming to him is. You may have never heard it like that. This is, put it like this. You knew at one point in time, or you knew, have come to know in the last few weeks that if you died, you wouldn't go to heaven because your sin has separated you from God. And maybe you, you don't want that to happen and you don't want your sin to be held against you and maybe you, you didn't know what to do with it. Here's who can take it away. Jesus. He can forgive you of that sin. And maybe some of you, he, he has forgiven you of that sin. Maybe you're struggling whether you, to know you're saved or not. Come on back. We got four more uh, assurances that you can be assured of your salvation. You're going to know it for for sure, and you know that it's always going to be around. We're going to look at these, what they're based on, and how we can be assured of our salvation. Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sin and for yours because I couldn't be good enough. But because of the things we see in Jesus' life, we know he's God. And God came down and he took my sin on him and your sin on him and died on a cross for the punishment of those sins. And he was laid in the grave. He was dead for three days. He was in the grave. Then on that third day, he was raised from the dead to everlasting life. And through trusting him, we will have that everlasting life. Remember, truth stands forever. So our life, our salvation has to be built on truth. And that truth will last forever. This is what we're sharing with you, the truth. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Y'all have a great day. Great day. Remember, drive in church Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Look forward to seeing you there.